Well, good evening. Welcome. Uh, my name is Brian. Uh, I am the executive pastor here at Refuge. And just, just before I forget, love to meet you after the service. So if you're new or you're visiting, I'll be up here kind of hanging around and taking down band equipment probably after the service. Come up, say hi, let me know your name and that you were here. I'd appreciate that and love to meet you. We're going through a series and we're wrapping it up as we move towards Easter called Journey with Jesus. And we've journeyed quite a few places. We've journeyed down to the lush Jordan Valley into the river there. And we've journeyed then out to the wilderness in the desert. And we went up to the mountain. We went down to the valley, the garden that is there in the valley. And all these terrains have been varied. And as we've kind of built this series as a team, we've purposely tried to alternate kind of the highs and the lows. We would be at a high point for Jesus and then kind of a low point. The mountains and then the valleys. And we've done that purposefully because... Well, that's kind of a reflection of our lives. We have highs and we have lows, and it kind of alternates and ebbs and flows. And so this week, we continue our journey with Jesus, and we're kicking off Holy Week because Easter is next week. Tomorrow is Palm Sunday. Man, by God's providence, my daughter and I both real or she didn't realize, I just noticed she had palm trees on her shirt. I'm like, nice. And I'm like, I got palm tree. We dressed for the occasion tonight for, for Palm Sunday tomorrow. And so we're going to look at what is titled, if you go to your Bible, usually there's little headings, you know, at different sections. The heading at this section is called the triumphant or triumphal entry. And that title is kind of interesting because, you know, it's triumphal, but Jesus is going to his death. And so it kind of sums up the contrast of Holy Week. Holy Week is the week in Jesus' ministry where everything seems to fall apart. Everything unravels, then results in the death of Jesus. But it's also the week, as we know, this side of the cross where everything in Jesus' ministry comes together. And so this week, I want to do something a little bit different. We have been focusing on location, and we have been focusing on terrain. Tonight, more so, I want to focus on Jesus' mode of transportation. Before we get to that, though, let me set the stage of what is happening at this time. In the Jewish faith, there are three major festivals. I'm not going to make you tell me those festivals or those feasts, but I'll just tell you this is why the Jews at this time are traveling into Jerusalem. And so Jesus, who, if you don't know, by the way, is Jewish, he is headed to Jerusalem for the big three, the biggest of the three festivals, and that is Passover. Now, we're a church here. I know a lot of people are church, so I'm going to assume most of you know the story of Passover, but I'm just going to give you a little crib notes version just in case. The Passover is actually looking back into the ancient history of Israel about 1,300 years before Jesus. It's when the Israelites were first enslaved by the Egyptians. And if you've seen the movie, maybe it's Moses, and he comes in to the Pharaoh, and he says, let my people go. And the Pharaoh's like, no, nope, not going to do it. Sounds like Ross Perot there a little bit. That's not who I, or no, it's George Bush, not going to do it. Um, no, he says, I'm not going to do it. And then God releases these 10 plagues, and it's frogs. If you hate frogs, you really hate that one. And it's the flies, and it's the boils, and then the locusts come, and the water turns to blood. But the 10th plague, the final plague, is the worst. It's the death of every firstborn male child in the nation. But God gives Israel a way to save their firstborn child. Exodus chapter 12, if we go back to the Old Testament, second book, verse 21, says, Go pick out a lamb for each of your families and slaughter the animal. Take a bundle of branches and dip it into the blood. Brush the blood across the top and sides of the door frames. Verse 23 says, For the Lord will pass through the land to strike down the Egyptians. But when he sees the blood on the top of the door frame, the Lord will pass over your home. He will not permit his angel of death to enter your house. And so God is essentially saying to Pharaoh here that death is coming. He's saying to the people of Israel, death is coming. Nothing can stop it. Not even the most powerful military ever assembled, which was Egypt at that time. The only thing that can save you from this death is to put your hope in the blood of a little innocent lamb. This past Tuesday, Presley and I went to see John Mayer in concert. Uh, She likes his guitar playing and music, and it was a great concert. And I love going to concert and live sporting events, but you know the worst part about that? 
It's the traffic, man, the getting in and out of these cities where everybody's trying to pile into one place. And it was kind of cool at the concert. John Mayer recognized that, and he just said, he was really nice. He said, hey, I just want to thank you. I know you hate sitting in traffic, and so it means the world to me that you were willing to sit in traffic to hear me play my guitar. So I thought that was kind of, kind of cool that he said that. This is Jerusalem now during the Passover. People are flocking in for everywhere, and the city can't handle it. Some commentators say the city swelled to four to five times its normal population. And so there would be traffic jams. And what comes with traffic jams? Anger and frustration. And there would be crowds. Oftentimes, Gentiles, non-Jews, they would show up just to see the spectacle of it all because it's kind of this big spectacle. And remember, why are they there for the Passover festival? Well, animal sacrifices. And so there's this festival going on, everybody's coming to town, and there's just blood everywhere. One scholar I read this week said, within that one week, 250,000 lambs were sacrificed, not to mention the doves and all the other things that were sacrificed uh, to God that week. So it's kind of a growth, I don't know if flies and stuff were around, but it's this bloody scene, people everywhere, hot. And so for context, the story of Jesus here, 1,300 years after Passover, This is what's happening, and now once again, Israel is oppressed. They're not captive, but they're certainly not free. The new superpower, not Egypt, now it's Rome. And so Jerusalem, during Passover, would be this hot religious bed of just passion about their holy week. And then you've got the nation of Israel there, so there would be a lot of nationalistic pride and political zeal. They would be looking back to what God had done for their people, but just as much so They would be looking at their captors now and longing and praying and desiring for God to do it again. And so that's where we pick up in our story this week. The story is in all four Gospels. I put on our Facebook page, you know it's important when it's in all four Gospels. So this story is in all four Gospels. I'm going to primarily use Matthew's account as we read through it. Matthew chapter 21, verse 1, and it goes like this. And Jesus and the disciples approached Jerusalem. They came to the town of Bethphage on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of them on ahead. And I don't know what two he sent ahead. It doesn't tell us anywhere. Maybe Judas, maybe Peter, we don't know. But two of the disciples, they went on ahead. It says, go into the village over there. As soon as you enter it, you will see a donkey tied there with its colt beside it. Untie them. And bring them to me. If anyone asks what you are doing, just say, the Lord needs them, and he will immediately let you take them. And I've read this a hundred times. Every time I read that, I can't help but see the Star Wars scene, you know, from the very first one where Obi-Wan Kenobi is going into the town. He sees the stormtroopers, and he's like, what's he say? These aren't the droids you were looking for. That's what I feel like Jesus has basically told them to do, some Jedi stuff here. Verse 4 says, this took place to fulfill the prophecy that said, tell the people of Jerusalem, look, your king is coming to you. He is humble, riding on a donkey, actually riding on a donkey's colt. Old Testament is full of messianic prophecy about the coming king, about the Messiah. Some of the ones that we know, it says he's going to be born in Bethlehem or he's going to be born of a virgin. Some of them are he's going to be betrayed by a friend and sold for 30 pieces of silver, that his garment was going to be divided, or we know he was going to be pierced for our transgressions. These are all prophecies in the Old Testament. Here we have one from Zechariah, who was a prophet about 500 years before Jesus. And so Jesus, in summoning up this donkey and having it brought in, is trying to bring forth this prophetic image for his disciples by acquiring this donkey. And it's pointing back to, again, that verse, look, your king is coming. He is humble, riding a donkey. That word humble, it's actually the Hebrew word anava. It literally means the afflicted. And so the humble king is the afflicted king, or it could be translated as the oppressed king. And where that word was usually used in the Old Testament, anava, it would be to refer to a poor person who would have to resort to begging to get their sustenance. And so for Jesus to start this journey that we're going to go on with him tonight, the king has to borrow a donkey for his grand arrival. 
And I put borrow in my notes in quote because I don't know that they actually give the donkey back. Jesus never sinned, so I know he didn't sin, uh, steal the donkey, but he borrowed this donkey. Verse 6, it says, The disciples went and did just as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. And so they've got Jesus on this donkey. Their cloaks are now the saddle. We fast forward a little bit by verse 8. They're coming into town. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from trees. And we all know from other, other verses or other gospels that these are palm trees, so they're palm fronds that they've cut down from the trees. And it says they spread them out on the road like kind of a red carpet. We also know from other gospels they were waving these palm fronds. And if you grew up in the church, you probably had Palm Sunday, especially here in Florida where you went outside and you waved your palm fronds. Verse 9 says, The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. This is a celebration. The party is on. The king is has arrived. So I want to talk about a couple of things, these palm branches. It's funny, it's like that is our symbol for Palm Sunday, these palm branches, and it's just this kind of thing that, that makes us reflect back to this event. But these are kind of like a symbol of national pride. It's their version of the American flag. This is like the Jewish flag. And so when they kicked the Greeks out, their, their previous oppressors, they raised up palm fronds to celebrate that they were victorious. And when they dedicated the new temple, this beautiful new temple, they waved palm fronds to celebrate, saying, we are victorious. And so what's happening here is a lot of political uh, zeal and excitement. And they're waving their flag. It's like a political convention almost. Like, here's our candidate. This guy, he's coming. This is our guy, our king. He's going to restore our nation. He's going to put Israel back on top. He's going to put our people in power. It's electric. It's a party. And they're singing, Hosanna, Hosanna. It's literally translated, save us, save us, God. And so there's this party and this scene and this nationalistic pride. And then we turn to Luke's gospel for a little hint of where Jesus is at with all of this. Verse uh, 42 in chapter 19, it says, As Jesus came closer to Jerusalem and saw the city ahead of him, he began to weep. How I wish today that you of all people would understand the way to peace. And so you've got this party and you've got Jesus weeping on this donkey. Here's why. Jesus knows this crowd that is there, that is celebrating him, will soon dissipate. Many of them will turn against him. Even the most faithful of his disciples are soon going to betray him, deny him, run away, hide. So Jesus knows they weren't celebrating the humble king that was coming in front of him that would bring peace to the world, but the one they wanted to be there, the king who through power and might would put Israel back on top. See, for us on this side of the cross and knowing the full story, as C.S. Lewis says, it's easy for us to have chronological snobbery, to look back and be like, man, why were they looking for political salvation when Jesus was offering full salvation for their souls? But don't we kind of do the same things? I mean, human beings are fickle, and so how often have we seen other people or perhaps ourselves get pumped up and excited and rally around that new political leader or that new self-help guru who is the guy today or that new cause that everybody is celebrating or that new bumper sticker philosophy that's, that's going all over social media? only to just walk away when it eventually doesn't meet our needs and let us down, which it always will because it's not Jesus. That's one thing. But what about Jesus? We know what he did for us on the cross, on this side, and yet we still come to him waving our palm branches in the air, singing, Hosanna, Hosanna, God save us. But what do we want him to save us to? to safety. 
God save us to safety. God save us to comfort. Blessed is the one who will give me my best life right now. Man is made in the image of God, but we try to create God into the image of man, and then we tell God what he should do. And so we create these imaginary Jesuses, the political Jesus. We'll use that political Jesus, his name, to legislate family values and morality, to keep Christians in power, to put Christians at the top of the food chain. Or we create a Bob Ross Jesus. Y'all know who Bob Ross is, right? If you don't know Mr. Rogers Jesus, it'll do the same thing for you. He's humble. He's meek. He's gentle. But he just wants to give you happy little clouds. Never convict you. Never challenge you. Just a beautiful day in the neighborhood every day. Or we create the Santa Claus Jesus often in the church. If I'm nice this year and not naughty, then that means, Jesus, you owe me. You owe me good gifts. If my faith is strong, then that means I get to name it and claim it. That's the deal. I do, you give. Or it's the Tony Robbins Jesus. Five easy steps to a happier and healthier life. It's time for another breakthrough. Forgetting the breakthrough happened already when we became Christians and nothing ever can separate us from that love. And I guarantee I just stepped on a whole bunch of toes in this room. And that's good. I should have. Because if we're honest, we all want Jesus to Hosanna us from suffering, from struggle, from suffering, from loneliness, from exhaustion, from meaningless, from our existential crises, from our health, or we want answers, or we want clarity, or we want blessings, but we want to define those blessings. And hear me, Jesus can and ultimately will give us all of that and fix all of that. But as Paul writes, what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory God later will reveal to us. And so, yes, Jesus will end loneliness, just maybe not in our time frame. And yes, he will bless us with riches we cannot even fathom, just not always as we expect. Maybe the riches that we don't understand. And he will give us clarity when we need the clarity, but not necessarily when we want the clarity. But so often, we're just like these people, and we're raving our palm fronds. Hosanna! Hosanna, God! Fix it! God, make it happen! God, we've waited long enough! God, I don't care about all those people. I care about me. Save me and save my people. And when God's timing and when God's solution doesn't line up with the Jesus that we've constructed, we hold it against him. Or even worse, we turn on him like these crowds eventually do. See, Jesus is doing something amazing. Jesus is doing something these people do not understand because they don't know the whole story. Jesus didn't come to the earth to fight the wars we want him to fight, but to fight the wars we don't even know that we're in. And to win that war for just Israel, or not just Brian, not just Israel, but for all people, that's what the Lord was called to do. And so the people are there and they're celebrating Jesus' entry into Jerusalem because he thinks, or they think, that he is there to conquer nations and to conquer empires, not knowing that he came to conquer sin and death. And so to change our chant from Hosanna, God save us, Jesus came to change that to where, O oh, death, is your sting. Where, O oh, hell, is your victory? See, the cross will finalize that victory. And we're headed there next Saturday and Sunday if you're here with us. But before Jesus finalizes that victory on the cross, he uses this mode of transportation to usher in the victory and to teach us what it looks like. I was laying in bed this morning up early, couldn't sleep, still had work to do on the sermon, in fact, so I'm kind of thinking about some things, and 
I'm like, didn't we just talk about a donkey not very long ago as like the main theme of a story? If you remember, and it had to do with a king, right? When King Saul was on his journey to, to go to, to Samuel and to be prayed for and, and all of that, it's like he's looking for his lost donkey. And if you guys remember, if you were here that night, like all three of you that might remember this, what did we say? What was the theme? What did I keep making you say? Does anybody remember? It, it's not about the donkey, So we just kept saying that, right? It's not about the donkey because God was doing all these providential things uh, with Saul. Well, this time, forget that because it kind of is about the donkey. (laughs) Over the half the verses, if you go through all four gospels, which by the way, sidebar here, as we come into Holy Week, man, let me just encourage you, take the time each day to go to a different gospel and read that gospel's account of Holy Week. You will be blessed. I will put that on social media this week as a reminder, and I generally every year go through, and Sunday I give the verses for Sunday and Monday and so forth. Just, Just encourage you to do that. You will be blessed and you will grow in your faith. But over half the verses, if you go to all four of the Gospels, reference the donkey. And if you're a student of the Bible, which I hope we all are, when you see something referenced over and over and over, it's something we ought to pay attention to. And so the question we ought to be asking is, why does Jesus show up to Holy Week riding a donkey? And the short answer is, he's showing just how low he will stoop, how low he will go to get down with us in our mess and to accomplish his purpose. But there's more to it than that. I want to go to that Old Testament prophecy. I'm going to repeat it, but give you kind of the rest of the verses that surround it that Jesus quoted. It's in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. It says, Rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous. He is victorious. Yet he is humble, riding on a donkey, Oh, scratch that, riding on a donkey's colt. Verse 10 says, I will remove the battle chariots from Israel and the war horses from Jerusalem. I will destroy all the weapons used in battle and your king will bring peace to the nations. In other words, y'all can stop fighting now. Verse 11, he says, His realm will stretch from sea to sea and from the Euphrates to the ends of the earth because of the covenant I made with you sealed with blood. In other words, I'm bringing peace not just to Israel, but to the world. And verse 16 says, On that day the Lord will rescue his people, just as a shepherd rescues his sheep. They will sparkle in his land like jewels in a crown. How wonderful and beautiful they will be. And I know, personally, as a student of the Bible, the Old Testament can at times be very difficult, but at times it can also be very beautiful. And the donkey is what tells us this beautiful story. See, as Jesus is kind of processing into Jerusalem on this day, there would also be Roman soldiers who would be processing into town to kind of keep the riots down and to take care of the streets. And I've always, when I read this story, like to imagine one of those soldiers coming up upon this scene. And as a soldier, he would have attended a procession like this before, except the ones he has attended were done right. It would be well organized. The king would ride in on a large stallion, head held high above everyone else. What does it look like to ride on a stallion? I mean, it's like, that's glamorous, right? You're you're riding that stallion. I had a terrible job of illustrating that, but it's, it's beautiful, right? If you've ever seen somebody ride a big stallion and they know what they're doing, it's beautiful. But it's not just any stallion. He would have the best stallion, the most tall stallion, the most powerful stallion. And if you were anybody else, you never dared got next to the king with a horse better than his. That was just a faux pas. You did not do that. Now, behind the king and his stallion would be his soldiers. Not just any soldiers. Their armor would be polished. And they would be flying real flags of their nation. And then they, behind that, they would f- have the flags of the nations that they captured. And there would be musicians. And there would be dancers. And there would be pageantry. And at the very end of the procession, you would find the riffraff, the prisoners of war, the slaves, people begging from anybody they could beg from. And they would be there, a lot of them in change of living proof of the king's power and what happens to those who define him. And so this soldier would be there and he would be displaying or surveying this scene. And he would look out, he would would just laugh. 
And he would search the masses and he would hear them say, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And so he's, where is this king? And so he would look and he would look and he's no stallions. And he'd look and he'd see, this is weird, the slaves and all the riffraff are actually leading this procession and they're all over and they're in the crowd. It's like a virus, they're everywhere. And these silly people, they don't have flags. They cut out a branch out of a tree and they're waving it in the air. Is this Saturday Night Live? Is this a parody? And then he would search for that king. Where is this king? Surely that's not the guy. Wait, wait is he crying? There's no royal robe. There's nothing majestic or regal about him. Nothing to attract you to him. Nothing in his appearance desirable. By the way, that's Old Testament prophecy too. And to top it off, this king is riding not a stallion, but a donkey. Do you know how pitiful Jesus would look riding a donkey crying? I've never ridden a donkey, I don't think. I don't think you can look good though right stallion you're up here a donkey it's just like uh, uh, yeah I don't know you, you imagine it yourself but riding a donkey is not a pretty thing and, and on top of that this isn't a big donkey we're told multiple times this is a donkey's cult a baby donkey for my Spanish friends a burrito right here that Jesus is riding Jesus's life his ministry his teachings Man, they were full of paradigm-shifting contradictions. But I think this donkey might be one of the best ones. And so I imagine that day being one of his disciples. And you've followed Jesus. He is the promised king. And you're like, this is the greater Moses, the greater David, David, my Messiah. And so the disciples are right. All right, Jesus, king, this is your moment. The people are ready to crown you. What kind of horse do you want? Clydesdale? Kentucky thoroughbred, Jesus says, no, I'll take a donkey. His disciples confused. They say, ah, oh, Jesus, I see what you're doing. I, I see what you're doing. Get you eight strong donkeys so that they can pull your chariot of gold. That is an excellent idea, Lord. That's so much better than riding in on a single stallion. And Jesus says, no, I already got a donkey picked out, just one. Go into that village over there. And there's going to be a donkey. And next to that donkey, there's an even smaller one. And that, my friends, is how we'll usher in the kingdom of God. Then imagine being in the crowd here, waving your palm fronds, shouting Hosanna. And you're just full of hope and expectation. I imagine you're a little scared because you are risking something by being out here, saying, here's our new king, because there's already a king in place. You'd be full of nationalistic pride and arrogance, and you'd be, this is our moment. And all of a sudden, the guy you've put your hope in, the guy you've put your faith in, your king, makes his grand arrival on a donkey. I asked Karen yesterday, I couldn't remember the name of this toy, but did anybody have growing up, um, it's called a sea and say? It's like this round thing, and it's got a thing that spins on it, and there's a bunch of animals around the outside, and you pull the string, and it spins, and it says, the cow says, moo, and you pull it again, the dog says, roof, 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 or whatever. Well, a question tonight, as we finish and go through the rest of this sermon, we pull it back, it spins around, it lands on the donkey, what does the donkey say? Jesus is riding this creature, this donkey. Here's the thing, man. It's pretty cool if you think about this. This is a creature that he created from the cellular level right up to those goofy-looking buck teeth. Jesus created the donkey, knowing when he created the donkey, that was how he was going to make his grand arrival. And so what does the donkey say to those who were there that night and to us here tonight? And so let's spin it. The donkey says... That we know of power and force and control and influence and greatness. And what we know of all of that is about to be flipped upside down. Spin it again. The donkey says that as a citizen of God's family, we're going to have to choose humility over arrogance. We're going to have to choose gentleness over violence. We're going to have to choose generosity over greed. That's what the donkey says. The donkey says... It's time for you to step away from your self-centeredness 
and start to treat others like they are kings on a high horse. The donkey says that the face of a child with Down syndrome is more beautiful than that model on the cover of a magazine. That the homeless man on the corner is more important than the person you think might help you climb your social ladder. That a small, messy church is just as valuable to the kingdom of God as a well-organized megachurch. That's what the donkey says. The donkey says God is often found in those most unkingly of things. God is found in a donkey plodding into Jerusalem. God is found in a woman in an unorthodox religious sect in Samaria. God is found in a paralyzed man at the pool of Bethesda. God is found on a cross at Golgotha. The donkey says, if Jesus didn't come in riding on a great white horse, then you need to come down off of your high horse. And we need to, too, relinquish our power and our authority and our stature. Tim Keller, um, he has a book called Jesus the King. It used to be called King's Cross. Now they've changed the name for some reason. Um, it's basically kind of a commentary on the Gospel of Mark. But as an early Christian, it's one of my favorite reads, and I read it every year. Here's what he kind of says in reference to this. He says, God says the route to gaining influence is not taking power. Influence is gained through power. Influence gained through power and control doesn't really change society. It doesn't change hearts. God says, I'm calling you to a totally different approach. Be so sacrificially loving that the people around you who don't believe what you believe will soon be unable to imagine the place without you. He says, they'll trust you because they see that you're not only out for yourself, but out for them too. When they voluntarily begin to look up to you because of the attractiveness of your service and love, that's when you'll have real influence. It will be an influence given to you by others, not taken by you from others. And here's where I'm getting to. Who is the model for that way of gaining influence? It's Jesus himself, of course. How did he respond to his enemies? He didn't call down legions of angels to fight them. He died for their sins. As he was dying, he prayed for them. And if at the heart of your worldview is a man dying for his enemies, then the way you're going to win influence in society is through service rather than power and control. That's what the donkey says. You know what else the donkey says? It says, stop taking yourself so seriously. Sometimes we need to modernize some of the context in biblical language. Um, we don't ride horses. We don't ride donkeys. We have these things called cars. And I thought this week, it's really easy to get pretty arrogant when you've got the stallion of cars. Or let's call it a Ferrari, right? But it's a lot tougher to be arrogant. And I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings with this car if you drive it, but a 1993 Ford Fiesta, I mean, when you're driving a Ford Fiesta, you can't take yourself too seriously, especially when it's from 1993 and 2022. And so you get a lot more opportunities to laugh at yourself. I mean, you're sitting there on the side of the road, broken down again. And to be honest, yeah, uh, it's a little embarrassing for me right now driving in this car. So you have to get honest with yourself and your motives and your heart when you ride a donkey or a Ford Fiesta. The donkey says, I know a lot of you go to dinner together after church. We encourage that. And so maybe when you're at dinner tonight, you just start brainstorming some of these out. What does the donkey say to us as Christians and in this story? That God will never justify our greed. That God will never justify your lust for power or your self-centeredness. I don't know what you come up with. The donkey says who Jesus is. The donkey says who God is. The donkey says what his kingdom will look like. The donkey says what our lives will look like when we ride with Jesus. God could have snapped his fingers and saved the world, but he doesn't. He decides to save the world first and usher it in by riding a donkey in the town, just like he partners with you to accomplish his purpose. We all have a chance at being the donkey in God's story. When God says, not that human, that, that little human, that even smaller one that no one would expect, that's the one that I want to use to do some great thing. This donkey got to be a part of Jesus' journey to save the world. 
donkey. This donkey is famous, right? I just spent the last 30 minutes talking about this donkey. He's in all four Gospels. But I wonder on that day, what was the donkey thinking? I wish this guy would get off my back. This is kind of embarrassing. I'm not meant for this. This isn't my purpose. I'm not qualified. I'm a little donkey with this king riding on my back. One more thing. It's not easy to ride a donkey in a world that over and over tells us we need to jump onto the biggest and the bestest and the fastest and the most beautiful horse we can find. But the donkey says, the king of kings, God incarnate, was humble enough to ride a donkey on his way to be enthroned on a cross. And so we can ride our donkeys too. So I want to close tonight with a time of communion and worship. It's been a while since we've done that. And one of the things, again, the donkey says is that the new kingdom is coming. I mean, it's the start of Holy Week. The new kingdom is coming. And this new kingdom is one marked with humility and love and not war and striving. The donkey says, the new Passover lamb is here. And if you'll take this lamb's blood and you'll place it over the doorpost of your heart by saying, Hosanna, you only got to say it one time. God save me. And that's it. And then our Hosannas, we don't have to say that anymore. We just say thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. Thank you, Jesus, that you have washed me white. Thank you, Jesus, that you have saved my light, brought me in the darkness from the glorious light. And so we're going to do communion tonight. And man, COVID two years ago, I don't know, however long ago it started, we've been using cardboard for communion for the last two years. We get to use real bread tonight. It's time. And so we're going to do communion the refuge way, the way we did two and a half years ago pre-COVID. There is a table here, a table there, and a table to your right, my left, in the back of the room. And as the band begins to play, just humble yourself. Envision yourself as the donkey coming to the table to partake of the blood and the body of Christ. Or imagine Christ riding on his donkey to have his blood shed and his body broken so that you could say Hosanna and turn that to a thank you. So won't you stand, make your way to the tables, take the bread and the juice as you feel led as we sing this closing song.